Okay, I might do the opposite for Amber because I want to be able to see see her their talk. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe I'll. But you do whatever you want to do. Yeah. 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 I mean, listen, part of me gets it. Like, we're all overworked, yes. and like, any chance to rest, I, I understand. Like, it's not like I've been to every round. Oh, no, you know? Absolutely. But I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So part of it's just kind of an institutional culture. Like, do we want this to be a thing or do we not? Yeah, like, let's decide. Yeah. 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 That's right. Not anymore. Yeah, yeah. We have writers' voice. Whenever you want. Should I start? Sure. Okay. Or should I wait? What time is it? 9.03? Yeah. Okay. Is this on? Hello. Good morning, everybody. 903, so we figure we should get started. Um, welcome to the second day of the 41st Brown Symposium. Yay. Um, <laughs> I won't repeat what I said last night at the welcome because I know some of you were there, but um, just a reminder that this is only the second Brown Symposium in the long history of the Brown Symposium that's been co coordinated by two Brown shareholders. And so everything that you're going to see and hear today is a reflection of us collaborating on how we could bring um, the political science work of Dr. Selbin and my art historical work together. Um, and so art and social change is something that came pretty naturally because we both um, do research and teaching on that subject. Um, but the theme particularly of radical imagination strikes us as um, both necessary and inspirational because it invites us to think about what we want to happen after a revolution. What kind of change can we build in the future? So today, this morning, we're gonna have two talks. The first will be by Kirsten Lang. Um, her talk will be virtual. She had an emergency and was not able to come to campus. So she'll be, oh, there, there she is. <laughs> she'll be on the big screen talking about um, humor as a strategic tool for um, feminist goals. Then we'll have Amber Johnson, um, a communication professor who will be talking about futurity in academia. We'll have a lunch break. Um, we do want to make you aware that we'll be sure to break shortly before noon so that those of you who are interested in participating in the protest that's been organized by students will be able to do that. Um, after lunch, we'll come back together to hear a talk from Anthony Romero, um, an artist from Tufts. Then we'll have the gallery reception opening right in the same building down the hall, curated by our own alum, Kelly Johnson, for the curatorial talk. And then tonight, starting at seven o'clock outside the Fine Arts Building, we'll have a performance by um, DJs, the Chulita Vital Club. So we've got a full day of activities and events for you. We hope you can make as many as possible and welcome.
and there'll be fair food at the uh, DJ event. Uh, so let me introduce uh, our first speaker this morning. So the thing about <clears throat> our first speaker this morning is she's funny, like seriously funny, and, and probably done more than anyone to help slay the myth that feminists aren't funny, um, and in fact, seriously funny. Uh, she's an associate professor of women, gender, sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts, widely published, widely read, and widely taught, including here on our own campus, feminist historian whose research interests range from comedy to tragedy, spanning humor and comedy, sexual science, and the endings of pregnancy. The author of the book, Sexual Politics and the Feminist Science, with work in the leading journals in her field, her 2020 article in the Journal of Women's History on the anonymous feminist female anti-racist artist, The Gorilla Girls, Art, Humor, and Activism, is frankly brilliant and should be required reading across academia. 2022, in Studies in American Humor, her article, Comedy as a Practice of Care, will make you rethink laughter, and I can't encourage you strongly enough to take a look at it. She's currently working on two book projects, Pleasure, Play, and Politics, A History of Humor in U.S. Feminism, which explores feminists' use of humor in their activism and art, and Beyond the Silence, Stillbirth in 20th Century America, analyzing the changing meaning and experiences of late-term fetal death from the 1890s to the present. Please join me in welcoming Kirsten Lang. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's it's <laughs> it, it took my breath away, <laughs> but I couldn't believe you're talking about me. Um, I just want to start by thanking professors Kim Smith and Eric Selbin for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event. Um, it really is an honor, and I'm, and I'm grateful to be here with you. Thanks also to Laura Polanco, Kelly Lassard, and uh, Randy Avenel for making it possible for me to join you virtually. Um, I really, really would have loved to be with you in person, um, but unfortunately, my body had other plans. Um, nevertheless, I'm, I'm so grateful for this chance to share and discuss my research, and I thank you for all coming out today. Um, I just want to offer a quick content warning uh, that sexual violence is a, is a topic that will come up in the talk. Um, and one last caveat, uh, I share my home with a number of non-human animals and um, I've done my best to kind of mitigate distractions to them, but I, I do apologize in advance if one of my uh, canine research associates um, decides to pipe in from time to time. Um, <clears throat> with that being said, I actually want to start my presentation with a joke. How many feminists does it take to change a light bulb? There are, are many answers to this comedic setup. None, because feminists can't change anything. Or one, she just holds on to it while the world revolves around her. Or there's the concise classic, that's not funny. The underlying punchline of each iteration is of course the same. Feminists are humorless scolds. The myth of the humorless feminist has deep, resilient roots in American culture. It has taken many forms over the 20th and 21st centuries, shifting from the stern sexless suffragette to the hairy-legged man-hating women's liver, and now the performatively woke PC policewoman. The point of calling feminists humorless is frankly to, to, to delegitimize and even dehumanize them. Representing feminists as humorless paints them as lacking a trait that is considered not just desirable, but indeed fundamental to social interaction, and some argue to human nature. It serves to scare off potential new adherents and supporters, and arguably it's been successful. I can't count how often I've heard people preface some basic assertion of gender equity with the disclaimer, I'm not a feminist, but... Personally, uh, I have to say the humorless feminist stereotype has always struck me as a bit odd and really contrary to my own lived experience and what I observed in the world. Um, I grew up watching funny women like Lucille Ball, Gilda Radner, Whoopi Goldberg and Margaret Cho, 
And I've also had the pleasure of working with many feminists in a range of different organizations who approach their work with wit, joy, and admittedly at times gallows humor. My suspicion of this humorless feminist trope further deepened in graduate school. Though my dissertation explored feminist scientific writing on sexuality in early 20th century Europe, an unlikely place to find humor for sure, I discovered over the course of my work that feminist scientific texts deployed reason and irony simultaneously. Reason to build and advance their empirical arguments regarding female sexuality, and irony to expose and deride the arrogance of their male interlocutors. My broader graduate training in feminist history further attuned to me to the fact that throughout the 20th century, humor flowed through feminist activism, whether in the form of texts, theater, or protest songs. Feminists dedicated to a range of causes, including sex workers' rights, racial justice, lesbian visibility, and pay and representational equity, have all mobilized humor in their work. Humor also infused feminist culture from the performances of stand-up comedians like Kate Clinton and Leah Delaria to comics drawn by Alison Bechdel and Diane DeMassa. Yet perhaps somewhat surprisingly, when I went looking for humor in historical scholarship on US feminism, I found very little. There are to be sure numerous wonderful studies of female professional comedians and comedic actors. However, rare is the book like Sarah Warner's Acts of Gaiety, LGBT Performance and the Politics of Pleasure that take humor seriously. If anything, most of the historical liter literature on US feminism treats humor as a problem, namely as a source of women's oppression and as a diversion from the serious work of movement building. This, I have long thought, represents only part of the story. So proceeding from my own love of comedy and my knowledge of feminism's humorous history, I decided to document and analyze the roles humor has played in the history of US feminism with a focus on the later 20th century. Since 2015, oops, I'm just gonna move, I'll be doing this throughout. I'll just move my, my head so you can see these pictures a little better. All right, since 2015, I've conducted research across the US to excavate evidence of humor in US feminism from the women's liberation movement to the present. So some of these images that you see on the screen here are from the women's liberation era. Um, up in the right corner, you see the famous uh, protest of the Miss America contest in 1968. And then in the center is um, one of the members of Witch, which was an organization um, that did kind of pranks and zaps and which stood for Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. So, the, and these are documents I found from the archives. Uh, in consultation with librarians and archivists, I've explored collections belonging to both famous and little known individuals and organizations, and have surveyed a wide range of texts, including journals, letters, newspapers, photographs, zines, posters, protest signs, buttons, and t-shirts. I've approached these materials through the lenses of uh, feminist humor theory, particularly the work of Amber Day and Cynthia and Julie Willett, as well as other relevant conceptual literature from performance and affect studies. I've also sought to evaluate the reception and impact of feminists humorous practices by engaging with a range of sources, including contemporary media coverage, letters from fans, audience responses, and participants retrospective collection, recollections. Over the course of my research, I've discovered that across different times and places, humor was a crucial weapon in feminist struggles against prevailing gender and sexual ideologies. Humor has been a powerful resource for feminists because it mobilizes both the intellect and the emotions. By creating a play frame that allows, as communication scholar Steve Gen as Stephen Gencarella puts it, an interrogation of values through the imaginary, Humor frees people to take intellectual and emotional risks. Humor, there, humor thereby enables people to consider challenges to status quo thinking and envision alternative ways of being and living and perhaps even transform their attitudes. Thus, whether as speech, visual art or street theater, humor manifests a playful pedagogy 
that works by disarming and amusing its unwitting audience. Humor also has the unique power to work on multiple emotional registers and can combine and provoke feelings of anger, joy, and pleasure. As such, humor facilitates the creation of new communities through shared laughter. As Cynthia and Julia Willett have recently argued, new research into the enteric nervous system is revealing humor to be a full-bodied affair that can create visceral connections between individuals. However, it's important to note that feminist humor works differently for different audiences. For those already sympathetic to feminist critique, critiques, Humor provides a balm to weary spirits by inciting knowing laughter and creating bonds of community among the like-minded. For those unfamiliar or uninitiated, humor offers the excitement of engaging with particularly edgy rhetoric, performance, and ideas. And for those hostile to feminist messages, humor finally enabled feminists to mobilize the benefits of humor's ability to disavow its own message by pressing the critic with the question, can't you take a joke? Importantly, for all the cognitive gymnastics humor occasions, it doesn't encourage an ironic distance among its audiences. Rather, the point is to inspire a compelling emotional response that would encourage individuals not just to take up the critique, but to join the feminist movement. Humor enriched and enriches the effective dimension of feminist activism and consciousness and strengthens collective bonds. It encourages a sense of shared pleasure between feminists and their audiences and among feminists themselves. So in the remainder of my talk, I wanna illustrate these insights through examples of humorous feminist activism and culture, namely by exploring the work of the Gorilla Girls, the Lesbian Avengers, and lesbian feminist cartoonists, Alison Bechdel and Diane De, Diane De Massa. I have a, a lot to say about all of them, and I'm going to examine some of their texts and activism in detail, um, but I obviously can't cover it all today. So I really hope you'll be taking notes and drafting questions so that we can critically analyze them together during the Q&A. So perhaps the most famous group I examine in my research is the Gorilla Girls. The Guerrilla Girls were a collective of women-identified artists who, beginning in 1985, deployed humor, and especially irony, in wheat-pasted posters to expose uncomfortable truths about sexism and racism in the art world. They adopted the names of deceased women artists and donned guerrilla masks to hide their identities. And the masks, the guerrilla masks, were a play on their name, Guerrilla. Although the Guerrilla Girls are still active today, their composition has changed significantly since the early 2000s, and thus I refer to them here in the past tense to indicate their original collective. Over the course of their activism, the Guerrilla Girls created several now famous posters. The most renowned of these is, is arguably their 1989 gloss on Jean Auguste Dominique Ingres's Grand Odalisque. And you can see the body here, the, the, the kind of human body. Um, that's from the original. However, in this version, the Autolisk wears a gorilla mask and provocatively asks, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Right? This, they, this is a way of they're kind of subtly critiquing the lack of actual female artists in the Met Museum. Intriguingly, and, and perhaps ironically, um, the Guerrilla Girls activist art now hangs in 60 cultural institutions around the world, including those that they had previously criticized for sexism and racism. So I'll move myself here again between these posters. Um, I actually want to spend a bit of time examining two of their lesser known creations. Um, the first of these on the left hand of the screen um, is a poster from 1989 that's titled Relax Senator Helms, The Art World Is Your Kind of Place. Um, this poster was, was released at the height of Republican Senator Jesse Helms's attacks on the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, at that time, conservative senators like Helms and uh, Senator Aldamato were agitating for strictures on federal grants to artists and curbs on the NEA's ability to disperse them. Um, 
Helms and others' ire was particularly stoked by the grants endowed to the photographer Robert Maplethorpe, uh, with whom some of you may be familiar. Um, these senators were particularly upset that, that government money was being used to support his um, incredibly beautiful, but also incredibly homoerotic imagery. Um, and so they sought to, to put an end to funding challenging art like that. What's intriguing about um, the Gorilla Girls poster is that it not only takes aims at Helms's puritanical approach to art, uh, but it also attacks the art world's affected outrage at the senator. One could, in fact, argue that the poster's biting sarcasm serves equally as a critique of Helms's puritanism and as a rebuke of art world pretensions. Drawing connections between Helms's racism, sexism, and homophobia, all of which were matters of public record, and the institutional manifestations of these phenomena in the art world, the poster lists 10 reasons why Helms should not fear the art world. These include, quote, Women artists have their place. After all, they earn less than one third of what male artists earn. Museums are separate but equal. No female black painter or sculptor has been in a Whitney Biennial since 1973. And the majority of exposed penises in major museums belong to the baby Jesus. By demonstrating the ways in which Helms might feel at home in the art world, the Gorilla Girls aim to disabuse the art world of its self-conception as progressive, edgy, and avant-garde, and instead portray it as conservative, showing much in common with the Puritans who sought to censor them. Another example of the Gorilla Girls' critiques can be found in their 1993 graphic, Hormone Imbalance, Melanin Deficiency, which you see on the right hand of the screen. This poster was part of what Gorilla Girl Alma Thomas, nicely kind of coinciding with the name of the theater you're currently in, um, what Alma Thomas described as the tokenism campaign led by herself and Gorilla Girl Julia de Borgos. Here, the Gorilla Girls made clever use of a New York Times magazine cover featuring 12 white male artists described by the copy as art world all-stars who were all featured in the trendy Pace Gallery. Although the focus of the cover was this collection of artists, above their photograph was an ostensibly unrelated header referencing the magazine's other content. And I don't know if you can really read it because it's quite small, but it says, good health, the self-health movement. To make their point in the poster, the Gorilla Girls simply reprinted the New York Times Magazine cover and below it in black bold font, declared the assembled men and the gallery they represented to be suffering from hormone imbalance, melanin deficiency. Rather than refer to itself as a public service announcement, this poster playing on the text of the Times cover offered itself as a diagnosis. Apologies, my <clears throat> mouse seems to disappear. There it is. The Gorilla Girl's brilliant play on the discordant textual elements of the Times cover enabled them <clears throat> to deploy medicalized language to frame the art world's racism and sexism as pathologies and as dangerously unhealthy. In the first decade of their existence, the Gorilla Girls' advocacy seemed to produce results. Following their critique of the 1987 Whitney Biennial's lack of women and people of color, the 1993 iteration featured approximately 40% women and 35% artists of color. However, in 2015, when the girls conducted an audit of major New York museums to count the number of one-person shows dedicated to women artists, they found that since 1985, the numbers had barely moved. The Gorilla Girls themselves were not shocked by this backsliding. As they noted, women and people of color had been excluded from the art world for hundreds of years. They didn't expect the situation to dramatically improve over the course of decades. Yet despite the unevenness of empirical evidence of progress, the Gorilla Girls affected a sea change of consciousness within the art world. Their unique and ironic activism drew widespread media attention, thereby amplifying their messages. They also received fan mail from around the world, including famous feminist artists like Barbara Kruger. As one Gorilla Girl noted, even if they were only talking to the converted, the girls' activism gave their audiences strength. The same member recalled, quote, every single time we would go on a gig, 
at least one person would come up to me and say, you changed my life. I really have the strength to go on now and do my art. Moreover, for the girls themselves, belonging to the collective was transformative. Empowering is the word most often used by members to describe the effects of membership. In interviews, many girls described feeling empowered to speak their beliefs and su subsequently gained the ability to depersonalize the professional rejection they faced and learn to challenge their anger into their artwork. The group's wit, camaraderie, and collaboration help sustain and nourish members, both personally and politically. Like the Guerrilla Girls, humor was at the core of the Lesbian Avengers activism from the beginning. The members of the Lesbian Avengers were veterans of the women's health movement and had been active during the 1980s with AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP. The Lesbian Avengers were dedicated specifically to issues of concern to lesbians and aimed to enhance lesbian visibility. They formed in 1992 in New York and eventually spread throughout the United States and Canada. From the beginning, humor was a decidedly queer strategy for the Avengers. It enabled them to serve pointed critique with a smile and to rattle the foundations of heteronormative thought and institutions while cultivating joyful and vibrant community. Co-founder and veteran activist Maxine Wolf recalled, quote, people are always saying that lesbians don't have a sense of humor. We wanted to prove them wrong. Indeed, the Avengers 1993 Dyke Manifesto declared, quote, lesbian Avengers believe in creative activism, loud, bold, sexy, silly, fierce, tasty, and dramatic, arrest optional. Over time, the Avengers became famous for their audacious protests and their signature move, eating fire circus style, which is pictured here, you can see on the left, on their Lesbian Avenger handbook. In their inaugural protest on September 9th, 1992, on the first day of school, the Avengers descended on Middle Village, Queens to protest that school district's rejection of New York City's rainbow curriculum. The rainbow curriculum was an effort at multicultural education in the city's public schools and included lesbian and gay history and civil rights. With a live marching band in tow, the Avengers paraded through the streets singing songs like Sister Sledge's We Are Family. Once at the school, they handed out balloons reading Ask About Lesbian Lives, while also wearing t-shirts that read, I was a lesbian child. The Avengers purposely um, created a carnival atmosphere, not only to explode the taboo surrounding gay proximity to children, but also to challenge the stereotype of the dour and dowdy lesbian. I'd like to show you a few minutes of the action to give you a sense of what it looked like, even if the video cannot translate the emotional charge of the event. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to do this seamlessly. Sharing sound. All right, and hopefully someone can let me know if, if um, this doesn't work. All right. Ladies and ladies, gentlemen and gentlemen, we are the Lesbian Avengers! <laughs> It's weird. That is weird. <laughs> what makes it weird? Teach about lesbians. What's that? Te teach what? Kids? Well, yeah. I mean, don't you think kids get taught about a lot of different things, right? I think, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, you can teach kids. Yeah. Teach them about gays, too. Right. Yeah, it's 
That's good. That's good. Where he's going, all the way down? Yeah, to uh, Middle Village School, I think it's called. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. Amazing what goes on, huh? What do you think of it? Everybody to each of their own. I ain't gonna play today, boy. Oh, no, stop that. Boy. <laughs> More power to him. I'm passing out balloons to school children on the first day of school that say. Move it! Give the balloon back, but let it go. Give me that balloon. today because I have really mixed feelings about this, especially as a teacher. I'm, I'm afraid that we're, that we're harassing the kids a little bit. But I came because what I've been reading in the papers and seeing about what School tw Board 24 is doing is not just not doing in some kind of passive way, but taking on an active campaign of hate and intolerance. And I just can't stand to see that in another school. I'm demonstrating here because I, uh, I think children should learn about love, not about hate. I also think that the people who are against lesbians and gay men in the school curriculum have a larger agenda, which is uh, racist, and is to get rid of the multicultural curriculum. And we're, they're attacking us because we're easy to attack. Jonathan, see you later. Okay. All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So obviously there's a lot to unpack in that in that clip. Um, and I hope we can we can return to it in the Q and A. Um, obviously, the protest occasioned a range of different reactions. Um, and and I just want to kind of highlight three things that I think are significant before moving on. Um, one being the way in which their protests threaded together different issues, right? That they were able to see the connections between homophobia and racism, right? And bring that to the fore um, in, in the protest. Um, and the other two points I kind of want to raise here before moving on are just um, these little moments that I think really speak to um, the potential of humor, right? One of them comes kind of towards the beginning of the clip where um, they're walking down the street in the band and there's a woman in a green shirt and a floral skirt who kind of sees them passing by and she literally stops in her tracks and turns around and watches them and I've seen this clip so many times and I keep thinking to myself what must be going through her head right even if it's some kind of ultimate rejection right that the fact of that marching band being there in, and performing in this upbeat way does occasion a moment for reflection, right? A moment for thought. It's literally kind of arresting. Um, similarly, the teenage boy who's interviewed right after that, right? The, the kid in the hyper pink shirt, um, you know, even though his initial reaction is like, that's weird, it provides a moment of reflection and engagement, right? That might not have otherwise existed. And the fact that it was done in this kind of lighthearted manner took some of the, the threat and the danger out of discussing it, right? To the point that he ultimately says, like, you should teach about gays too. Um, so I, I, I find this clip so fascinating and I think um, really illuminating in terms of thinking about the possibilities of humor. Um, so, the school protest that we just saw was obviously infused by a kind of joyful spirit while carrying a serious message, um, but not all Avenger actions were so buoyant, um, especially when dealing with issues like sexual violence. 
the Avengers um, use their protests to alchemize anger and laughter. One striking example of, of this is the Bob at Q weenie roast um, that the San Francisco chapter held in January 1994 to support Lorena Bobbitt. Um, I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience uh, may be too young to know or remember who Lorena Bobbitt was. Um, Lorena Bobbitt kind of became famous, or I should say infamous, um, after she cut off her husband's penis following years of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse, right? She often became a punchline, especially for late night comedy um, because of the fact that she did cut off her, her husband's often neglected was she was, um, she was the victim of domestic violence. Uh, she, was also, um, she was also an immigrant from Venezuela uh, who depended on her husband, John Wayne Bobbitt, for her legal status in the U.S., and she couldn't leave him as a result. Um, the Avengers Weenie Roast uh, didn't just protest the treatment um, that Lorena Bobbitt was receiving both, both in the courts and in the media. It also drew attention to the plight of a woman named Kay Bottoms, who also lived in Virginia, um, Kay Bottoms' child was removed from her care by Judge Buford Parsons because she was a lesbian. Um, and what uh, Judge Parsons actually did was place Bottoms' child with Bottoms' mother, whose partner had sexually abused uh, Kay Bottoms as a child, right? And so one of the things that the um, Avengers also brought up in their protests was that the courts would rather place a child with a sexual abuser rather than keeping the child with his lesbian mother. Within their press releases, the Avengers stated that the purpose of their action, the weenie roast, was to expose the vulnerability of immigrant women like Lorena Bobbitt and lesbian mothers like Kay Bottoms. However, the Avengers also acknowledged that the impetus behind the weenie roast lay in, quote, the sheer pleasure inherent in roasting the penises of a rapist and a powerful homophobe. Their media alert also promised, quote, fantastic visuals and sounds. There'll be an Avenger chef at the grill leading chants like yes means yes, no means no, or else that penis has got to go. There'll be a sewing circle featuring an Avenger dressed as a male doctor and frantically sewing a weenie onto a doll pausing occasionally to grimace and hold his own crotch. There'll be scores of Avenger waitstaff handing weenies and information to the crowd. We'll bring the grill and the turkey weenies. You bring your appetite, but be prepared to lose it when you hear what's been going on in Virginia. Beyond attracting media attention and new members, and I should say this event was extremely successful in that regard, the Bobbitt queue is significant for its symbolic reenactment of John Wayne Bobbitt's castration. Rather than discard the severed penis, the Avengers made it an object of female consumption, right, in the form of a, of a turkey weenie. In so doing, they dramatized and ridiculed castration anxieties. True to their name, the, the action was vengeful, uh, yet playfully so. According to the Avengers, Bobbitt and Parsons deserved a roasting for their misdeeds. And if neither the law nor the court of public opinion would do anything, they would use fire to make justice their own. The Avengers' audacious play on deep-seated patriarchal fears helped communicate crucial messages about both domestic violence and lesbophobia to a phallically obsessed society. To be sure, the Avengers had their detractors. Some commentators feared that the Avengers' humor would alienate the straight mainstream and either encourage backlash or stifle dialogue. Writer Jeff Epperly actually accused the Avengers of seeking fame over sociopolitical change and conflict over solutions to problems facing the LGBT community. Invoking a very 90s reference, Epperly called the Avengers the beavis and butthead of the gay community. Even founding member, um, writer, the writer Sarah Schulman, eventually distanced herself from the group. Despite helping to draft the Avengers Dyke Manifesto, she feared that her writing career would be, quote, overshadowed by her hobby, which is how she ultimately characterized her activism within the Avengers. Nevertheless, the Avengers received a considerable, a considerable amount of positive, even tending toward enthusiastic media coverage. Many viewed the Avengers as an energizing force in queer politics. 
The New York Times Magazine even wrote a glowing profile that praised the group for its theatricality and use of humor. Lesbian feminist media outlets like Diva, Dyke Speak, and Off Our Backs covered their actions excitedly. Journalist Del Del Medina remarked that she was, quote, not the only one who's responded to their wake up call, a potent concoction of humor, danger, and a sex positive attitude. A retrospective autobiography written by a former member has also stated that the group provided a crucial sense of community. In her memoir, Eating Fire, My Life as a Lesbian Avenger, Kelly Cogswell claims the Avengers offered a voice in the queer wilderness that encapsulated anger, pleasure, and hope. While humor was clearly part of the strategy and ethos of some feminist and queer feminist activists, it also infused feminist culture. A great example can be found in the work of queer feminist cartoonists. Beginning in the 1970s, artists like Roberta Gregory, Lee Mars, and Mary Wings began depicting lesbian life in comics form. The medium arguably took off in the 1980s and 1990s, perhaps most famously in Alison Bechdel's beloved serial Dykes to Watch Out For, but also in series like Dan DeMasse's Hothead Paisan, Homicidal Lesbian Terrorist. And um, the, the image you see on the slide is actually something I found in um, Alison Bechdel's papers at the Sophia Smith Collection of Women's History just down the road from me here in Northampton. Um, and pictured here you see, um, for those of you unfamiliar with these strips, um, this was co-drawn by Alison Bechdel and Dan DeMasse. And on the left, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. Um, this is the protagonist of, of Dykes to Watch Out For named Mo. And uh, this is the protagonist of Hothead Paisan, um, Hothead Paisan herself um, with her, her cat, uh, Chicken. And uh, the reason I kind of, I love this image, um, not just because it gets both of those artists on one, in one uh, comic cell, um, but also because the image was prepared as a fundraiser for, um, the Stonewall Center, the LGBTQ Center at my home institution, UMass Amherst. So I have a special affinity for it. So the two series I've just been talking about, um, they both existed as part of a larger and diverse universe of lesbian feminist cartoons that appeared in a range of publications, including alternative presses, self-published zines, and anthologies of queer and feminist humor produced by small independent presses. In fact, by the 1990s, the number of lesbian cartoonists was such that they actually formed a lesbian cartoonist network that included Bechdel and DeMassa, as well as um, people like Jennifer Camper, who founded the Queers and Comics Conference, and other artists like Joan Hilty, Chris Kovic, Noreen Stevens, and Jackie Urbanovic. Um, through the network, these artists supported one another shared information and tips, gave feedback on each other's art, and followed and championed each other's successes. And this, um, this picture on this slide is actually from one of the newsletters of the Lesbian Cartoonist Network. That this dynamic world of queer feminist comics existed is perhaps stating the obvious for those who came of age in the 1980s and 1990s who frequented women's and LGBT bookstores and for whom these cartoons provided a vital sense of community and affirmation of subjectivity. Um, and I'm always kind of struck when I present about um, queer feminist cartoonists, the number of people who come up after and, you know, they don't necessarily have questions for me, but they want to share their experience with these comics, um, which I find very, very uh, telling. These cartoons offered diverse representations of queer, queer women's lives and perspectives on contemporary issues. Taken together, they demonstrated the heterogeneity and plurality of lesbian experiences and certainly defied the homogenizing impulses of mainstream representations. Now, some of you may know Alison Bechdel, who's pictured here on the right, um, already from her celebrated autobiographical memoir, which became a Broadway show called Fun Home, or its follow-up, Are You My Mother? However, Bechdel first gained fame through her long-running series, Dykes to Watch Out For. Dykes to Watch Out For followed the lives and loves of a tight-knit group of lesbian friends living in an unnamed American city that really closely resembles Minneapolis. Described by Bechdel as, quote, half op-ed column and half endless serialized Victorian novel, the strip commented not only on contemporary lesbian life, but also on late 20th century American politics, culture, and society. 
While comics was its medium, generically, Dykes to watch out for was more akin to a gentle satire that both criticized current events and lovingly poked fun at lesbian feminist culture and practices. Her approach is captured, perhaps glibly as, as the comic scholar Margaret Galvin has suggested, in Bechdel, Bechdel's declaration that she would love to be the lesbian Norman Rockwell. In interviews, Bechdel has shared that she saw her cartoons as an antidote to the prevailing image of lesbians as warped, sick, humorless, and undesirable, or supermodel-like pentathletes, objective fodder for the male gaze. According to Bechdel, quote, it was so comforting to see my queer life reflected back at me, I would have kept drawing these dykes to watch out for just myself. She's described the impetus behind dykes to watch out for as stemming not from an overwhelming need to create it, but rather, quote, from an overwhelming need to see it, to see my particular queer progressive slice of life reflected back to me. Dykes to Watch Out For was published in serialized form from 1987 to 2008 and appeared in dozens of newspapers in the United States and Canada. It also spawned 12 anthologies published by the Ithaca-based Firebrand Books. The strip blended the political with the prosaic, and a great example can be found in the cartoon um, that I've pasted to the left called On the Road, which depicts her characters en route to the 1987 uh, March on Washington, which was a major protest um, for LGBTQ rights, um, but also as a protest to demand greater government attention um, to the AIDS crisis that was unfolding. So I just want to give you uh, a few moments to, to read the comic, the comic if you haven't been doing that already while I've been talking. So I'm, I'm going to hope you had a chance to read it. Um, hopefully it's big enough on the screen that you can read it. Um, but what, what I find noteworthy about this particular strip and why I chose it as a, as a good example of kind of dice to watch out for writ large um, is that while the characters express their legitimate frustrations regarding the quotidian burdens of homophobia, racism, and sexism, they, they are themselves are mocked for their assumptions regarding the heartland and properly queer subjects, right? They assume that anyone with a cowboy hat is going to be a homophobe, right? The story, you know, like most of these do over time, resolves happily with a sense of camaraderie and eros in the air. Um, although there was, you know, over the course of the strip's long, uh, long run, there were various dramatic moments and tension-filled episodes, there was usually a positive resolution in the end. Um, although this particular strip's title invokes Jack Kerouac, um, it obviously bears no trace of his sexism and individualism, right? So that's, that's Bechdel and Dykes to watch out for. Um, a very different comic is um, Dan DeMassa's uh, uh, Hothead Paisan Homicidal Lesbian Terrorist. Dan DeMassa's um, comic gave voice to the fury felt by many readers who endured misogyny and homophobia on a daily basis, right? It's obviously not the same kind of overwhelmingly positive and lovingly satirized representation of urban lesbian life on offer by Bechdel. As journalist Elena Bouvier put it in the introduction of her interview with Dumasa, Hothead uh, Paisan is, quote, a socially bizarre dyke that's not quite up to political snuff who eats meat and likes sex toys, has never protested in Washington, DC, is prone to raving, including vicious mood swings, and into ambushing, farting, and hanging upside down. In the same interview, Dumasa revealed that Hot had originated from drawings and writings in her journal that she made while recovering from drug and alcohol addiction. <clears throat> At the same time, Demassa has insisted that Hothead was a satire and that her protagonist was ultimately likable, not only because of the sweet relationship she shared with her feline companion Chicken, her blind Zen priestess friend Roz, and her genderqueer love interest Daphne, but also because Hothead herself was, in Demassa's view, quote, really childlike. She does know somewhere deep down that what she's doing isn't right, 
but she's so confused by the depth of her own feelings. And the media too is a big part of it. She hasn't ingested the media's images of women and white heterosexuality, but she's taken on the violence that she sees in the media. And of course, she drinks too much caffeine. It was Dimas's partner, um, I should say then partner, Stacey Sheehan, who encouraged her to collect her drawings and publish them as a comic zine. Together, Dimas and Sheehan published the zine under the imprint Giant Ass Publishing and sold it primarily within LGBT and alternative bookstores. Hothead Paisan was published from 1991 to 1998, and eventually the strips were collected in, into an anthology published by Kleist Press in 1999. As theater scholar Sarah Warner has suggested, Hothead belongs to a larger genealogy of lesbian revenge fantasies. Hothead's explosive rage and righteous fury offers readers catharsis, and at times, arguably, the violence provokes shocked laughter. Regardless, her strip targeted misogyny and homophobia head on, without apology or concerns for alienation, as Hothead repeatedly killed and tortured oppressive men. Take, for example, the snippet that I've included on this slide, wherein Hothead dispatches a man who rejects women's bodily sovereignty. The frenetic style of cartooning captures Hothead's barely harnessed rage. Here, she manifests the anger felt by so many women at men's denial of women's right to self-determination and their occupation of places of power that enable them to legislate that denial. The unnamed, unspecified man is made to look grotesque, and in his ridiculous anger, he almost seems to justify Hothead's actions. Violence, rather than understanding, provides the strip's resolution, yet the extreme violence is textbook cartoonish on par with purportedly wholesome fare like the brutal cat and mouse saga Tom and Jerry. Hothead herself emerges as a deranged avenger, avenger desirous of a better world for marginalized people, though she's often flummoxed by her own overwhelming anger. Though the violent and explicit nature of Damas's work meant it would never achieve the same level of broad success Bechdel enjoyed, Hothead, Hothead nevertheless accrued an incredibly loyal fan base. The series even provided the inspiration for a musical written by the punk musician Animal Proof Rock, which was staged at the, women, at the, at the Michigan Women's Music Festival in 2004. The circulation of lesbian feminist comics like Dykes to Watch Out For and Hothead Paisan in a range of locally, regionally, and nationally circulating publications helped them to forge an expansive audience um, and this, this fact is kind of in evidence of, um, in the fan letters that were sent to these cartoonists. Um, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, the Sophia Smith Collection of Women's History at Smith College um, is home to Alison Bechdel's papers. And uh, within them, there's a fascinating cache of letters written to Bechdel by fans of Dykes to Watch Out For. These letters span decades and come from all across the United States, as well as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Germany, the Netherlands, Finland, Nigeria, Japan, South Africa, France, Spain, Singapore, Israel, Switzerland, Mexico, and Ghana. I made notes of all the places they came from, and it was shocking. There are hundreds of letters. Um, among the authors of such letters to Bechdel are famous figures like um, the pioneering Black feminist theorist, writer, and activist Barbara Smith, um, and queer artist activist Carrie Moyer of the Lesbian Avengers and Dyke Action Machine. Um, the letters are an incredible archive of feeling, to borrow from Anne Svetkovich, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name. Um, and what they reveal is that over the course of its long run, Dykes to Watch Out For was able to forge a diverse readership that responded to the series in different ways. Um, and a lot of the response was provoked by the humor that they saw there. Um, what I also find interesting about these fan letters is that they illuminate the incredible impact that supposedly ephemeral cultural products like comics can have on people's lives. Indeed, readers representing a range of subjectivities enjoyed and passionately engaged with Bechdel's strip. Some appreciated it as a work of art. Some claimed to be educated by it. Um, some believed the strip offered insights into universal human truths. Um, some were uh, sincerely and, and frankly unabashedly turned on by the comics characters and storylines and made no bones about expressing that. Um, 
common themes that emerged from the letters um, sent to Bechdel across decades and continents. <clears throat> and I, I, I should say that above all, what fans expressed was gratitude um, for the diversity and detail of representations on offer, for Bechdel's dedication to chronicling lesbian life and experience, for supporting progressive political causes through the characters and their choices, for providing a point of entry into the LGBT community and showcasing varied queer subjectivities, and for providing laughter, comfort, and solace in a hostile homophobic world. Fans exclaimed their love for the strip and for Bechdel herself. And sometimes, again, this, this love shaded into lust. Um, one of the letters I actually found um, featured a picture of a reader with the, uh, one of the anthologies of Dyke to Watch Out for covering her breasts. She was, she was naked. Um, readers gave feedback on the strip, offering commentary on storylines, um, suggesting new plot points, and even criticizing some of Bechdel's uh, authorial and stylistic choices. Fans shared their own life stories with Bechdel, highlighting their identification with the characters and their struggles, and even divulging difficult moments from their own lives that the strip helped them to endure. Non-queer identified readers shared the ways in which the strip provided a point of understanding for queer politics and encouraged them to learn more. Um, in fact, one reader who identified himself as a straight male shared um, with Bechdel that he actually started reading Audre Lorde after Lorde had been mentioned in um, one of the, the iterations of Dykes to Watch Out For. Perhaps one fan best characterized readers attachment to the strip when she declared that reading Dykes to Watch Out For felt like coming home. In recent years, groups like the Guerrilla Girls and Lesbian Avengers have become increasingly interested in preserving their history and creating their own archives. The current iteration of the Guerrilla Girls published a new book in 2022, cleverly titled The Art of Behaving Badly. Former members have also released memoirs regarding their experiences with the group, like Donna Kaz's Unmasked, published in 2016. Members of the Lesbian Avengers have created websites and documentary projects and have donated papers to the Lesbian History Archive in Brooklyn. This past summer, NPR published a positive retrospective about the Avengers on its website. I hope that my talk today has helped illuminate the value of not only recovering and documenting feminism's humorous history, but also of analyzing humor's roles and effects within feminism. Reclaiming feminism's humorous history not only brings long neglected groups and individuals to the fore of our collective consciousness, but also helps us better understand what humor did for feminism as a rhetorical slash pedagogical tool, as a form of effective sustenance for activists and audiences, and as a kind of communal and political glue. This history reminds us that humor is powerful. Um, it has the capacity to connect people. It can move us intellectually, emotionally, and physically through the force of laughter. And I would argue this laughter is not a simple sign of resignation. It can signal recognition and a determination to build community, transform consciousness, and affect change. Looking to evidence from the past, I hope we can consider what feminist humor might be capable of doing in our own fraught political moment and how it might be made manifest in the ever-changing cultural and political landscapes of the unfurling 21st century. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. So we do have some time for questions and Dr. Smith and Dr. Ling are in communication. And so uh, if you will uh, pose your questions, I think we have folks with microphones. I'm looking to see, yes, we do. Uh, so if you can just raise your hand. Oh, come on, don't be slow starters. Anybody? You're all processing. Ah. Hello. <laughs> um, I missed the beginning of your talk, but I just wanted to ask, how did you find yourself 
um, researching this type of topic? And how did you sort of find all of these resources? Because it's not something I think that is super mainstream. It's very interesting, but I just wanted to know sort of your personal journey there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna, all right. <clears throat> yes. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, um, it was a combination of, of um, personal interest, political experience, and kind of um, academic discovery. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up um, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, where, you know, there um, were increasing numbers of um, feminist comedians who were um, in the public eye. Um, at the beginning of the talk, I kind of mentioned figures like Margaret Cho and Whoopi Goldberg. Um, but even before that, right, um, you know, I, I had access to folks like Lucille Ball or Gilda Radner and Mary Tyler Moore, folks like that who, you know, were very funny and I was huge fans of their work as, as a kid and as a, as a teen. Um, and I was also coming of age, um, at, kind of in the flourishing of, of third wave feminism, right? Um, uh, and yet, I remember growing up, and I feel like my experience as a as a professor, uh, first as a graduate student, and then as a professor of of women, gender, sexuality studies, has been marked um, by the assertion that um, uh, feminists aren't funny, and um, uh, a disavowal of feminism that I suspect um, is due to negative associations, one of which is that feminists aren't funny. Uh, and it, is, it's, it was a kind of incongruity I couldn't make sense of um, because I was seeing all these very funny women and many of whom, you know, if you think about someone like Margaret Cho who have very pointed feminist insights to make, um, uh, on the one hand, and being told that feminists aren't funny and that you don't want to be a feminist and that, um, you know, you can believe in gender equity, but actually to claim the label of feminism uh, was anathema. You shouldn't do that. Um, that always struck me as a, as a strange tension. And especially as I as I got older and became inf involved in feminist causes, I was constantly meeting funny feminists all the time, um, doing very serious work, but approaching it um, with a kind of, of of wit and joy and you know irony at times. Um, so, so that inc that incongruity has has been with me for a very long time, right? Um, and then, as I started to do research as a graduate student um, in a field very different from this, um, actually looking at um, feminist uh, scientific writing on sexuality in the early twentieth century in Europe, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I would I would find evidence even in these scientific texts of humor, right, that they were using a lot of irony and sarcasm um, to kind of um, speak back to a lot of, of male scientists who had a lot of uh, very um, sexist things to say about women's bodies and desires. And so that, you know, and at the time too, in graduate school, you know, you're taking a lot of courses to kind of broaden your understanding of your chosen field. Um, and my chosen field was the history of, of feminism and women, gender, and sexuality. And, um, you know, I was constantly encountering throughout um, a lot of, of, of um, sources I was uh, seeing just evidence, right, of, of, of feminists using humor. Um, and so all of these things kind of contributed to um, my uh, desi desire and decision to um, pursue this a bit more. And especially since, you know, when I started to look at the historical literature, um, most historians that had written anything about the connection between humor and feminism treated humor as a problem, right? It was never seen um, either as something that could be positive or in a, mo in a that, that could be understood in a complex way, right? As, as doing something for feminism. And so, um, after I uh, finished my dissertation and got my first book project, um, in, in motion, uh, I decided to focus on this. And basically you asked also about the process. Um, I cast the net widely and I, I just, I identified um, all of the archives that, um, archives and libraries that deal with um, women's and gender history in the US and wrote to them 
and said, I'm doing, I'm interested in humor. What do you have? And then, you know, the, the work that you all do when you research and you, you find books on particular topics and you follow the footnotes, right? And you follow the sources and see where they were. And, and that's how I found, you know, places like uh, New, York, uh, New York University's Fales Library that actually has a huge collection of Gorilla Girls material. Um, so it was, it was um, a pretty inductive process um, on the whole. Um, and, you know, I couldn't like a lot of the things I discovered I could never have imagined, um, uh, including you know groups like um, a group I didn't get to mention in the talk, but a group like Coyote, which stands for Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics, which was a, a group that was founded in the '70s, that was the first organization in the U.S. to fight for sex workers' rights and demand decriminalization, and and humor was a huge part of the work that they did. Um, it also led me to engage with the pioneering Black feminist Flo Kennedy, who is a remarkable figure who's gaining a bit more attention. Um, there was a really great biography written of her about seven years ago, and, and she was a, a, an absolute pioneer in using um, humor in her speech as a way of getting people to really think about complex ideas um, like um, the nature of, of racist, patriarchal, homophobic um, power as kind of a complex, um, and also introducing ideas like horizontal hostility, like the ways in which um, a lot of left groups can fight one another. So um, it's been a it's been a really rewarding journey with lots of unexpected twists and turns that have been fully pleasurable. But I apologize, that was a very long winded answer to your question. got a bunch of them. Uh, so we were talking, uh, my friend and I were talking about how there seems to be more of a movement towards um, blacklisting or canceling people when they are um, saying the wrong things, especially in the trans community and um, specifically Me Too movement as well. And we're kind of wondering how humor could be brought into that movement or maybe what your thoughts are on both of those movements and how they handle humor. Okay, uh, I'm just trying to into the movement. Um, so um, thank you for, that's a, that's a very a complex question. And I think to, to clarify, um, are you asking how humor could be used to um, engage cancel culture and, and the Me Too movement or things like that, or how humor plays into, or is used by, for example, the Me Too movement? I, I guess the question is kind of how, I know that it, in some circles, especially when it comes to trans circles, um, when humor is brought in, it's, there's more of this idea of humor turns the serious issue into a joke, right? And there's a lot of negative feedback surrounding using humor or even sarcasm in the trans community that I've experienced anyway, seen. Um, so I guess, do you feel that it's something that should be used more for Me Too and trans uh, movements? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I'm just reviewing. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, I mean, when it comes to how humor is being used, right, a lot of humor scholars will make a distinction, you know, or will describe um, whether the intent of humor is punching up or punching down, right? So is humor being used to keep people down, to mock them, to trivialize their concerns, um, to make them feel lesser than? Um, or is humor being used to kind of give voice um, to people who have been marginalized to kind of allow them to make fun of the powerful um, 
to allow them to kind of um, point out the problems in the status quo through things like through through you know mechanisms like irony and things like that. Um, and arguably, a lot of um, what um, feminists, you know, the feminists I've studied were doing was the latter, right? They were punching up. They were trying to use humor from a position of of um, marginalization and oppression to kind of attack um, those that were keeping them down, right? Um, so I do think, you know, and I, I think about examples of, you know, when you're speaking about Me Too, um, thinking about folks like Samantha B, right, who until recently um, had her late night show Full Frontal in which she spoke about um, issues, per, you know, like cancel culture and like um, sexual um, harassment and assault and things like that, and was able to use humor effectively to bring attention to these topics and point out the problems um, as they existed. Um, and um, as it pertains to uh, the trans community, I mean, I think, um, you know, I would, I would uh, recommend uh, my colleague at Clark University, Rock Samer, has done some wonderful work about trans humor. Um, and I think they just published an article in um, the journal Feminist Formations. I believe it's Feminist Formations or Feminist Studies. And the title is something to the effect of um, trans humor as trans care. And, and um, Dr. Samer does a, a really fantastic job of showing the potentialities of, of humor for uh, trans people and trans community, and um, particularly focuses on the work of trans comedians like Robin Tran um, and other folks to show the ways in which people from the community are using humor um, to, <clears throat> to, you know, give voice to themselves, their lives, their concerns, and and to kind of um, attack transphobia um, through humor. So I hope I hope that answer helped somewhat. Um, but just to kind of yes, <laughs> I do think there's a role for it um, to kind of go to the the seat of your question. And um, these are just some examples of of how I see it um, working. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one more, maybe. So someone back here is ready to go. Um, hello. I, I was just thinking a lot about your mentioning of Alison Bechdel and like in Fun Home, for example, where, you know, it's it's so many genres sort of blended. You know, it's autobiographical, it's you know, family drama, it's historical survey, it's, you know, so many things. Um, and I was thinking along the lines of, you know, for a, for a graphic novelist, for example, uh, in, in what ways would you say they have sorry in, in what ways would like a, a graphic novelist do you say have certain advantages or challenges in the use of their medium that say like a novelist or like a screenwriter would you know be challenged or in other ways just you know have a different angle um and i was just hoping if, if you could speak a little bit more about that just along the lines of you know the use of humor the use of just their platform as a whole yeah, that's that's a yeah. great question. Um, and I, I'll say I've, you know, I've learned a lot by reading um, uh, comic scholars. Um, if I can give you a few names, if this is something you want to follow up on. Um, someone like Hilary Shute, um, who's written a lot about Bechdel and other um, artists um, like Marjane um, uh, Sarapti, I believe, who wrote Persepolis. I might be pronouncing her last name. Uh, incorrectly, and uh, Margaret Galvin is another person who's written a lot about this. Um, and I think uh, what I've learned from them is is um, the the graphic novel and the comics form benefits from a number of generic properties that are unique to it. Um, one being obviously the marriage of image um, image with words right with with words on number numerous levels right so you can have dialogue text you can have descriptive text at the bottom right which allows you to kind of layer um layer voices layer theme include irony right be between what's said and what's actually you know the, the text and the subtext so to speak but made literal um there's the um serial or sequential nature of it right um that allows these ideas to build in a very um orderly way. Um, and, and the fact that you are, as a reader, called upon to engage both with images and with text 
forces you kind of to cognitively slow down and absorb things on a number of levels. And there's there's an implicit kind of in dialogue between the the artist, you know, the text and the reader that has to take place given the sheer volume of information and detail that's on display, right? Um, and so these are some of the things that the comic scholars that I've engaged with have really drawn attention to about the the the, the um the power of, of comics as a medium. Um, and they also talk about the way, the intimacy of the form as well, um, that, you know, readers can again, identify not just with, with like with text, but with images as well, right? Um, and that that helps to, to forge um, perhaps more intense bonds between the reader and, and the text than, than exist when it's just simply a matter of, of you know, written words on a page. Um, I hope that question helps somewhat, but um, I definitely but, recommend, the, I definitely recommend the of Hillary Shute and Margaret Galvin to kind of pursue these, these things forward. Any more questions? We can get in another one. I see there's someone over there and there's someone down here. So Margaret can help. Hi. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts on uh, the people who say like it's I'm I don't relate to it so it's not my problem like how to best like be like well it is everyone's problem or um, how to how to respond basically or what the best like form of action towards it is. So um, are you, so you're asking um, for people who may be apathetic in the sense that they don't um, see these issues as pertaining to them, um, how to, how, how one can um, kind of uh, draw them into um, an issue as, um, as pertaining to them or just as, a, as something they should be concerned about even if it doesn't directly affect them? as something uh, pertaining to them, even though it's not directly to them. Yeah, um, that's, you know, I think, I, I think that's where the, the concept of justice becomes really powerful, right? That, that even if something, you know, I mean, the, the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria don't affect me personally sitting here in Northampton, Massachusetts, but, Obviously, you know, um, there's something that are, are an issue that I'm concerned about as a person who believes um, in justice in the world and, and, and fair treatment of all people and that all people should be able to live happy, healthy, safe, um, livable lives, right? Um, and so I think like what, what some of the folks, so just going to some of the examples um, from the talk, uh, what some of these groups and individuals were able to do is kind of um, um, point out, you know, again, through humor, oftentimes, like how these issues are matters of justice and how they can, you know, call upon us to respond, even if they don't affect us all, right? So um, the school protest um, that the Lesbian Avengers did, I think, did a great job of highlighting numerous issues um, that are concerning, right? Obviously the um, marginalization of, of gays and lesbians, but also um, how um, homophobia exists in concert with racism, exists in concert with, with misogyny, right? That they're able to draw these things together. Um, and, you know, um, by making a kind of spectacle of it, right? Think about that teen, that teenage boy whose initial reaction was like, that's weird, that doesn't affect me. But that eventually in talking to him about it and like talking about like, well, shouldn't children learn all about these things or, you know, that he was able to, to kind of be convinced like, oh yeah, okay, actually, yeah, that's, a, that's an issue, sure, yeah. Kids should be taught about that. They should be taught about gays too, right? Um, he was kind of, instead of just dismissing it, right? Like, that's weird. He actually kind of came to engage and care about it, right? Um, and on a kind of, in a different way, right? Um, the comics, like someone like Bechdel, who's able to represent through people's lives and their stories, um, contemporary issues and give comment on them, 
Um, and through the kind of particularities and intimacies of the form as, as was kind of raised with the last question, right? Um, people of all different backgrounds um, can get drawn in, drawn in and, and learn to care, right? And, and the fan letters that I, that I mentioned in my talk that were sent to Bechdel are just fascinating for, you know, a lot of people who wrote were, were themselves gay and, and lesbian and felt like, thank you for representing us in a positive way and in all our diversity. But then there are folks saying like, you know, um, I'm a, I'm a straight man. I, you know, this stuff is totally unfamiliar to me, but wow, I'm learning so much about like, um, you know, lesbian lives and issues. And, you know, you made me read this feminist theorist I never would have otherwise read. And the reason that he got hooked into it was through the humor of it and through the kind of humanness of it, right? Through representing these stories. Um, and so this, the, the act of storytelling itself was powerful in that regard and infusing it with humor kind of took out um, some of the sting and, and made it feel okay and almost playful for people to kind of allow themselves to engage with it. Um, so again, a long-winded question. I hope it did something to kind of address um, the core of your question. Is a mic headed your way. Hi, um, so I have a question. You were talking about Things to Watch Out For by Alison Bechdel and, you know, the narrative was like, she is killing men who are oppressive towards women. Um, and I know that around that same time, like Valerie Salonis wrote Scum Manifesto. I'm not sure how those dates line up, but she ended up being responsible for killing Andy Warhol. Um, and a text such as hers, you know, like what if somebody tried to write that off as comedy at the time and, you know, it ended up resulting in such tragedy as to killing, you know, a great artist. So how do you think that things such as that should be addressed? Okay. Um, Yes, so um, so yeah, there's there's a few a few things to to unpack in that question. Um, I think you mean um, Diane Damas's hothead paisan, right? The 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 violent, the more violent um, uh, vigilante um, cartoon. Um, uh, yeah, so so that cartoon was was uh, created in the in the nineties, and uh, Valerie Solanus. Um, shot Andy Warhol in the early 70s, I believe. Um, and he, he was injured. He didn't, he didn't actually um, die from, uh, he was, yeah, he was, she, um, she shot him in 1968. Uh, he didn't die at the time. He actually died in, in 1987. But I see, I see the concern, right? Like, how can we, how can we find, um, uh, you know, Hothead Paisan funny, um, when there are folks out in the world like Solanus who um, would shoot Andy Warhol, right? Um, it's, it's in some, it's, this is a really tough question in a lot of ways, right? Because um, we're dealing with the, the distinction between art um, and reality and the correspondence between representational acts and physical acts in the world, right? Um, and, you know, um, I think for the cartoon, you know, it's 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 contained on the page. And, you know, as I kind of alluded to in my talk, there's a hell of a lot of violent cartoons out in the world, right? So like I'm this, you know, Tom and Jerry may be an archaic reference for a lot of folks in the audience. Um, but, you know, and even for me growing up, that was an old cartoon, but nonetheless, you know, it's, for any of you who've seen The Simpsons, um, it's basically itchy and scratchy, right? Um, that's what they're making fun of with itchy and scratchy is Tom and Jerry, and it's violent as hell, right? But yet, um, people take that as, as humor, but I guess that there's something whenever, um, it's enacted between humans, that it, it, it hits differently. Um, what strikes me about Hothead Paisan is it's so dramatically over the top um, that it, it does, it hits differently, 
um, she's not, and she herself, I would say she herself, like, like I kind of gestured towards in the talk, hot heads, hot, hot head paisan herself, um, is also doesn't, she doesn't get away totally free from all of this. Like there is, you know, if you read the series, there is a way in which the violence that she enacts impacts on her over the course of the series. Um, but I'm gonna keep thinking about your question because I think that this is, it's a tricky issue that I certainly, as you can tell by the way I'm answering it, feel somewhat ambivalently around, right? Um, in that, you know, how do we judge the relationship or how do we distinguish between um, representational acts versus physical acts and how we can see one is funny and one is not. So thank you for that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep thinking about that. All right, we're gonna take about a 15 minute break, but please join me in thanking Dr. Kirsten Lang, an exceptional talk.